Jesus came was to save the lost, repentant sinners, and rejoice over their salvation. In this picture today, boy, this picture of the prodigal son returning home is going to show us what repentance looks like when God does find a sinner and saves them. In this picture, it's, you know, I just pray, I just hope God help us see it in fresh in a fresh way today. It's such a familiar story. It's painted in such beautiful, majestic colors. He gives the image of this prodigal returning home to a waiting and a welcoming and a rejoicing father. So, so hang on. Um, get your tissues ready to wipe your tears, maybe. Maybe you're, maybe you're this kind of person that just wants to pump your fist with joy. Maybe you're just kind of a person that it's kind of speechless when you come across such amazing truth and you just want to fall on your knees and worship. This, this picture is, it shows us our, our lostness and our sin. And like with the sheep and the coin, they're lost. The boy is lost. The younger son is lost. Verse 11 through 13. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that's coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, all he had, and, and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. This greedy, impatient, rude, ungrateful younger son disrespected his father. He dishonored his father with this request. He was selfish. He, he took all his resources to a far country, and wonder here if Jesus is picturing a Gentile country outside of Israel, which would make it an even tougher picture for a Jew to understand. Not tougher, but more, more out there. He took all his resources to a far country away from any accountability of anyone that he knew, and he squandered his money in reckless living. The brother, the elder brother, said in verse 30 that he squandered it with prostitutes, whether he's just kind of thrown that out there to make his brother look bad or whether he knew. I don't know that we know that, but but his his life in the, in the distant country is, is not smiled upon. He wasted his life in sinful, reckless living. Wasteful, sinful living is what his portion of what his father worked so hard for was spent on. What a selfish, short-sighted, sinful disgrace. See, this is us in our sin. Like this younger son, in rebellion to the Heavenly Father, we selfishly desire to live according to our will instead of His will. Unsatisfied in Him, God, our Father, we go looking for satisfaction in our sinful pursuits. We want to live our way with no accountability to the desires and commands of our Heavenly Father. We love ourselves, this world, more than our perfectly good and loving Heavenly Father. This is all of us. Romans 3, 10 through 12, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. The natural state of our hearts is to love other things more than God. And listen, to use His good gifts in sinful ways. The natural state of our heart is to disrespect God, to dishonor God, to rebel against His fatherly love, to leave Him for the sinful distant country. The grass there seems a tempting shade of green. And we, like dumb sheep, want to go graze on that side of the fence. Isaiah 53, 6, again. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. We're sinners. We go our way. We leave our Heavenly Father. So what happened to the younger son? Verse 14 through 16, and... And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. 
So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his field, fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. His money ran out. Famine hit the land after that. Uh-oh, he, he's, he's desperate now. Possibly in a Gentile land. He hires himself out to a citizen of that country, and he ends up feeding pigs. Now, to this Jewish audience this, that was listening, that would have been like, oh my goodness. Because Leviticus 11.7, you know this about Jewish folks. The, 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 the uh, pig swine were unclean. And so to possibly be in a Gentile land, feeding pigs, bad state, penniless, famine hitting the land, he's desperate. He longed to eat what the pigs were eating. Nobody helps him. He's at what we might call rock bottom. He's miserable. This is a picture of the destructiveness of sin. Sure, sin is fun at first. I'm sure it was for this boy. It appeals to our flesh. And it brings temporary satisfaction. It does. People that say sin isn't fun initially, they're lying to you. It, it is attempting. It is appealing. It does feel good at first, most of the time. It wouldn't be tempting if it didn't. It feels like freedom as we live independent, so we think. Independent of anyone telling us what to do. But really, what is it when we sin? We're slaves to sin. And if you don't believe me saying that, I, it's Jesus that says that. John 8, 34. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. That's as clear as a bell. And then in verse 36 he says, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus describes sin as something to be set free from, not something to go long for. Not something that we look at a longing world and go, man, they've got it so good. I'm a Christian. Oh, pitiful me. I can't do that. That's not what God shows us sin is. God shows us sin is something that, oh my goodness, thank, thank the Lord that I'm free from that. J.C. Ryle says, sin is a hard master. And the servants of sin always find it out sooner or later to their cost. Sin, <laughs> end quote, uh, that's the end of that quote. Sin ruins, it destroys, it defaces, it impoverishes us. It steals our life, it, it ruins relationships. Primarily our relationship with God. It brings, it, it brings dishonor to His name. This is the greatest cost, not what it does to us, but what it speaks to God. What we're speaking to God when we say, no, sorry not going to respect you, not going to honor you, not going to trust you, not going to yield to you. It's a sin against God. The worst thing about sin is not what it does to us, but what we speak to God when we do it. Sin separates us from all the true spiritual blessings of God. Just like this younger son was separated from his father, we're separated from God and all his blessings. Sin brings the opposite of what it promises. And this is where people make just a terrible value judgment. Many, here, here's what a lot of folks think. Many think that, that because sin brings what appears to be good feelings or maybe immediate results that they want, then, it, then it's got to be good, right? If it feels good, it's right, right? If it brings what I want, it's good, right? No. In that, in that case, what is right and what is good is based on what people feel rather than what God says. I heard John Piper use this illustration this week, listening to his sermon on this. He talked about skydiving and how, well, this wouldn't apply to me, but you can imagine for someone who would enjoy it. You jump out of that plane and just... When you jump out of the plane, the wind flying through and the freedom and the yay and the all right, everything's great. This is just an incredible, exhilarating experience. But then when it comes time to pull your parachute, realizing you don't have one. That's sin. 
It's exhilarating at first. It's freedom at first. It's great at first. It's independent and all that. But then we start to realize we're headed to destruction. And there's a splat at the end of this sin. Pardon my graphic illustration. Sin's pleasures are fleeting. Hebrews 11.25. Its wages are death. Romans 6.23. This is eternal death, deserved death, and hell. You see, so what we're, what we're seeing here is that there's a reason that Jesus went to such a great cost that he did to destroy sin. It's not good for us. So please don't be deceived and allured with the pleasures of sin. No matter what your logic is telling you, no matter what your desires are telling you, no matter what your parents are telling you, no matter what your friends are telling you, no matter what this world is telling you, don't be allured with the pleasures of sin. I want you to note something, too, about this boy. It was his, mm, this is so good, it was his misery that led this son to repent. Strangely, in his life, his misery became grace. So sometimes in amazing grace, God lets us get to the end of ourselves to get in a pigsty. Sometimes he lets us get to the end of ourselves that we may examine ourselves and repent and find ourselves in his loving, generous, welcoming, secure, and saving forever arms. And that's what this boy did. He repented. He came to himself. But, but note this before we read these next verses. He was living life. He was living sinfully. He wasn't really thinking. It doesn't seem about his, about his sin, about what he had left. And I, I, I ran across this this week. A, a constantly busy, full, distracted by worldly entertainment type of life can keep us from one of the greatest graces that God has given us. And you know what that grace is? Thinking. Reflecting, meditating. Some people don't repent just because they're so busy and they got no time to just sit and think and come to themselves. And so our busy lives with even good things can work to our detriment. I've heard it said that we're entertaining ourselves to death. So are you too busy or distracted to reflect on the most pressing matters, spiritual matters in your life? But the son came to a place where he had to think and a place that got his attention. He came to himself and he repented. Listen to these verses 17 through 20 and then we'll read 21 as well. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. And then listen to verse 21. After uh, his father embraced him, it says, And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Notice what this son did not do. He didn't blame his dad. He didn't blame his brother. He didn't blame his master that sent him out to feed pigs. He didn't even blame God for the mess he got himself into. Blaming other people keeps you from the grace of repentance. And it blindly keeps you in a sinful, destructive lifestyle. It feels good because you can blame shift and put, the, put it on somebody else. But what it really does is it keeps you from the grace of God. This guy, didn't, he didn't blame shift. He admitted that he had sinned. He expressed remorse over not primarily the situation sin had gotten himself into, but for sinning against God and his father. There's a difference there. For example, it's tax time. You may choose to cheat a little bit on your taxes. And that sin may lead you to get audited and get caught and put you in a bad situation. You might repent at that point. But what are you repenting for? Are you repenting because you got caught 
and it's bad for you? Are you repenting because, hey, God, I sinned against you? Are you, are you sorry for what sin did to you? Of course, we don't want that. But, but is, is primarily your repentance because you got caught or because you offended God, you dishonored God? Let me give you another one. One that hits home to me. In marriage, sometimes it's easy to want to make just snarky comments. And it feels good at the moment because you feel like you you, you you just kind of being smart about things and, and kind of feel good about putting somebody in your place. But what does it do to a relationship? It destroys a relationship. It, it tears down trust and love and, 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 and thinking of the other person and just building a relationship instead of tearing it down. And so when you realize that, are, are we sorry that our relationship is just destroyed and that's the reason we repent? Or are we sorry that, God, I, I, I did what you told me not to do when I disrespected my wife like that? You, you get, pick, get the difference? This son was not sorry primarily that he got caught or what sin did to him. He came and he said, I have sinned against heaven. He was saying, I have sinned against God and that against you. The truly repentant aren't regretful just for the hard life that sin gives them, but for sinning against the loving, generous, holy God who deserves our love and obedience and respect. So in great humility, they confess their sin that has dishonored God. Notice something else about this son. He didn't resign himself to this wretched life of rebellion. He didn't say, oh, well, my life is just over now. But he got up. He remembered his father. He went to the waiting and welcoming good father. The truly repentant see the goodness of the waiting merciful father. They turn from their sin and they come to the father who offers forgiveness. And because of Christ's work on the cross for sinners... 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I just absolutely love this quote from John MacArthur. Listen to this. Speaking of the son, his empty lifestyle had filled him with remorse for the past, pain in the present, and the bleak prospect of even more suffering in the future as he worked the rest of his life to earn acceptance. But as it turned out, he drastically underestimated his father. And this is where we see the beauty of this story. As we see the extravagant love of a celebrating father. Listen, listen. Verse 20 is a jewel. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Wow. The father sees the son from a long way off. Which leads some people to imagine that despite being disrespected, dishonored, and rebelled against, this dad was constantly looking and waiting for his son to come back. And so seeing him... With a heart of compassion and love, you can almost imagine this father's heart leap for joy. And I'm just putting my little imagination here. This isn't in scripture, obviously. I can imagine the father seeing the son and just, if he had, if he was working on something, just dropping the tool. Or maybe he was talking to somebody and they're like, yeah, 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 I saw that game last night. Oh, oh. I can just imagine him stopping. Dropping everything he was doing. Gathering up that robe so he could run. His eyes fixed on his boy. Running toward his long lost son. His feet fueled by the forthcoming embrace. 
Now running would have been a bit undignified for men of his likely age in that culture. Such a lavish display for an unworthy son would have been frowned upon by the listening Pharisees of the story, but he didn't care. His love drew him like a magnet to his son. Before the boy spoke a word of repentance to his dad, his dad was running toward him. And as he reaches the target of his overflowing love, he embraced him. The word is literally, he fell on his neck and kissed him. The joy of that moment is on full display in the story. Jesus didn't have to explain what happened in that moment. I, I, I just imagine Jesus is wanting us to feel this moment. He intentionally shows us what happened then. You know, Jesus intended us to see God as running out to get the lost, ready to welcome and embrace them. God is in control of the whole universe, but he sees one repentant sinner coming home and he runs to him or her. And this gracious father doesn't cross his arms in coldness. He doesn't look at the son and make him, son, make him prove himself. He doesn't put him on probation. He doesn't berate him. He doesn't shame him. Or he doesn't even start to explain what he expects him to do to make restitution for his wrongs. Oh, no. Those are the things that maybe the listening Pharisees might have thought was the right response, but not old dad. He runs to his son, and he doesn't even let him finish his rehearsed speech before he starts calling out the gifts of grace. Do you notice that? The son had planned to say, make me as one of your hired servants. But before he can even get to that part of the speech that he had prepared, the father said, look, let's, hey, servants, go, go get some stuff. Get these gifts of grace. The best robe, the best robe, a ring for his hand, shoes for his feet, the fattened calf being kept for special occasions only, found that special occasion it was waiting for. Dad's boy was back. And these gifts were signs of sonship, not servanthood. It was affirming that he was a son, not a slave. That he was loved and welcomed. He, he came in repentant humility, expecting to maybe just be a servant. But imagine how humble, yet loved, he must have felt as these gifts were lavished on himself. Welcomed as a son. Warren Wiersbe says, in, in the far country, the prodigal learned the meaning of misery. But back home, he discovered the meaning of mercy. And quote, this this is, is a picture of God's love for lost sinners who repent and come home to him. Listen to Psalm 103, 10 to 13. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. So why can God do this for us? Why can God not deal with us according to our sins because he dealt with Jesus according to our sins. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 10. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. You know the gospel story. God can welcome us home when we repent of our sins. Because he sent his son to take the wrath for our sin. And it was paid in full. And when Jesus is alive, he is risen. And when we put our faith and trust in him, when we, when we realize he's holy, when we realize we've sinned against the holy God. And when we confess that before him, we turn from that sin and look to Jesus in faith and say that is the payment for my sin. He is the payment for my sin and I believe and I trust in that Jesus and I, I want to be forgiven of my sin. He forgives us and he cleanses us 
and we start to walk a repentant lifestyle following Jesus, toward Jesus, living with the Father. Last week we were thinking about sheep. I mean, what Jesus did for us, I've told you this story before, it's like that mama sheep that, that, that you know, the, the eagle circling above or whatever the bird of prey is, and he wants to eat the little lambs, but the mama sheep just gets over the little lambs and the, 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 the bird of prey just, be, just eats the mom instead of the lambs and the lambs are saved. That's what Jesus did for you and me. He took our wrath. He died so that we could live. And when we repent of our sin, and when we put our faith in Jesus, as Paul talks about in Acts 20, verse 21, we who were dead in our sin are made alive. We who were lost are found. But it gets better than that. And we receive, as Romans 8, 15 says, the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry of a father. So he treats us as a child and not a servant. Yes, we serve God, but we're his child. We don't have to work as a servant to earn his approval first, to be counted worthy enough. No, we come in humility, knowing we deserve nothing. We put our faith in, in a good and gracious and generous God who gave his son that we might live. We repent of our sin, and immediately we are treated as a son, his son. God, God lavishes grace upon his children. Listen to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Great sin, when repented of, is met with greater grace from the Father. Pastor Andrew Wheely says this, God receives the penitent with the riches of heaven, the robes of Christ, the signet of sonship, the banquet of salvation, a kingdom for a beggar. That's what heaven is. End quote. This here is our satisfaction. Our satisfaction is with the Father and not with sin. Psalm 73, 25 and 26. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. We are satisfied in God alone. The world's pig food can't compare to God's fat and cat. So for believers, abundant spiritual blessings that more than satisfy are ours in Christ. So why do we seek to find satisfaction in the things of the world? You to note this too. We love this story. I love this story. I mean, I, I love what I get to do for a living. I get to sit in my office or in front of my computer at home and I, I get to just let scripture pour over me that I might give it on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night or a Wednesday. I get to, I get to do that. I love this story. I, I sat this week at my desk and read verse 20 and wept because I can, I can see the love of a father for a son. We love this story. This is one of the most famous stories in the Bible. But why do we love it? Because it shows the Father's extravagant love for sinners and His joy over us coming to Him. But I want you to notice something. His love is seen as great because the Son's sin is seen as terrible. It's like this. It's like if you're on the side of a boat, right? And the rail's really low. 
and, and you're kind of standing there, and maybe you're not paying attention or something, and, and one of your friends walks by you on the boat, like, hey, 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 come on, just be careful next to the boat. Flip over. It's kind of a loving act, right? But if you're on the edge of that boat, you're kind of goofing off, you're know, doing whatever you do, and you flip over and you fall into the water, and your friend that's coming this way dives in to go get you, that shows an extravagant great love. And that's what this story does for us. Of course the father loves the son before he left. But when we see the son and how far he went, and then the extravagant love that he received when he came back, it just shows how much God loves us. And so Jesus shows us the depth of the son's wretchedness so he could show the depth of the father's graciousness. So let's learn from this. When we share the gospel, if you want someone to see how good God is, you ought to show them how bad we are first. Then the grace of the gospel is unimaginably wonderful. If you avoid talking about how sinful we are because it's uncomfortable to talk about or it's a little too confrontational or it seems a little too, you know, whatever, if you avoid that, then you do a great disservice to someone's understanding of the amazing, gracious, welcoming love of God for repentant sinners. So as the father in this story couldn't contain his joy, and he celebrated his dead son being alive, his lost son being found, God's joy, heaven's joy, explodes in celebration over repentant sinners found by God. Those who were dead in their sins but made alive in Christ. This is worthy of heavenly celebration and worthy of our celebration. But there's one in the story that wasn't so happy. And we'll end with him. Verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and treated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, I have, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you, gave me, you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed a fat cat for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And the older brother was angry. In his mind, listen closely. I'm going to skip through this really fast, so just listen closely. In his mind, he deserved celebration. The older brother felt he deserved to be celebrated for all he had done, for obeying the Father serving his father, keeping his commandments all these years. In his mind, the wayward younger brother didn't deserve such celebration. Definitely not with the fattened calf. So sadly, it seems that the elder brother viewed his father more as a master or a commander than a loving father. Sadly, it seems the elder brother viewed himself more of a servant than a son. His relationship with his dad defined more by duty than love. Does that sound like somebody familiar that maybe Jesus is talking to? Pharisees and the scribes? This elder brother didn't even address his dad as father. He just said, look. The elder brother pictures the Pharisees who saw holiness as their duty in order to please God and gain his approval. And in their devotion to holiness, they self-righteously thought themselves as entitled, worthy of God's celebration over them, not the contemptuous, sinful, younger brother, tax collectors, and sinners. The older brother resented the father celebrating the younger brother, just like the Pharisees resented, G resented Jesus Welcoming tax collectors and sinners, the Pharisees were far from God's heart for lost sinners. Ligon Duncan's description of the elder brother, he says, what's going on here? You're hearing the voice of someone who thinks they haven't gotten what they've deserved. 
You're hearing the voice of someone who thinks they're entitled to God's favor, and therefore you're hearing the voice of someone who has no idea how to rejoice when those who do not deserve the love of God and the grace of God and the forgiveness of God receive it. This elder son thinks that he deserve, deserves what's coming to him from the father, this father. He does not think that he stands in need of grace, and therefore he cannot rejoice. End quote. These Pharisees, they were in need of grace. Their external attempts at holiness didn't erase their sinful hearts, their prideful motives, their unloving attitudes, and their hypocrisy. They were sinners too in need of God's grace, but they didn't realize it. They had been given so much from the Father. They had been given the Scriptures, the very presence of God's kingdom come in Christ. All this was available to them. He, he wanted them to be sons too. But instead of repenting of their sin, putting their faith in Jesus, coming to the Father, joining the party, celebrating His grace over sinners, they remained lost, angry, grumbling, and blind outside the party. But in incredible grace. Oh, God is so good. He's so much better than me and you. In incredible grace, the father goes outside to the older brother. And he entreats him to come inside, showing these Pharisees that he loves them too and he desires for them to come. If they'd only come in repentance and faith in him, they'd be celebrated over as well. And then they could join in the celebration over others forgiven and found. You see, those who realize they don't deserve grace and salvation, but are given it freely by God. They gladly rejoice when others who don't deserve grace and salvation are given it freely by God. So just as we close here, how do you relate to God? Do you relate to God as the older brother does or as the younger brother does? Let me explain. Do you see your relationship with God you're more like a servant. He's more like your commander. And you just do what he says. And therefore you, just, you think that your doing earns you status with him. Or are you like the younger brother who says, I'm not worthy to even be called your son. Forgive me, Father. My fear is many of us who grow up in church relate to God as a Pharisee. And we may say the right words, but in our hearts and in our lives that we really feel like we've done something to earn our salvation. And that God owes us. Because we've been good boys and girls. Hadn't been like all those people we, you know, you know that are out there. All of us are this younger brother who have sinned and fallen way, way short of God's glory and need to come in humble repentance and faith and say, God, I'm not worthy. Please receive me. And then receive the welcoming arms and embrace and kiss of a father. So if you haven't repented and turned to God through faith in Jesus, He's waiting to run toward you and welcome you. If you're a believer and you're living a rebellious life, that same Father is waiting to welcome you back. Run to Him in repentance. And just the last question. How do you relate? How do you relate to the younger brother type person? Do you relate to the younger brother as God does or as the older brother does? Let me explain. Do you relate to that younger brother like those tax collectors, those sinners, those people you think beneath you? Do you, do you look at them as, as oh, 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 I've received grace. I want you to receive grace. I want to run to you. I want to welcome you. I want, I want you to know of God's grace. Or do you look at them like, yeah, they just, they kind of they get what's coming to them. They deserve it. They deserve. You get upset maybe a little bit when somebody who's done something so horrible 
comes to God and gets forgiven, and does that just feel a little unsettled to you, or does it exhilarate you? When you see somebody that is that is living a life of rebellion, do you want to go give them grace and mercy and show them love that they might turn and see the grace and mercy and love of God, or do you just want to kind of say, I don't want to be around you, and I kind of want to let my relationship turn cold to you, and I, I, I want you to just feel your isolation. I want you to feel your, I want you to feel the place that you're in. And then when you come back, maybe I'll, you come back to me like this. Maybe it's a coworker, somebody that you just kind of want to distance yourself, a family member, just somebody that you want to distance yourself from, and you really don't have a lot of grace for them. You don't want to go love them. You don't want to go be like the father to them. Remember, people who realize they've been shown grace undeservedly so, they go give grace to those who are there. So, when the wonder of an extravagantly loving father who sent his son to bear the wrath for our rebellious, prodigal lives overwhelms us, and we'll have no problem giving grace to others and seeking to meet their needs, no matter who they are or what they've done, and we will not be able to rest until others know the saving grace and lavish love of the Father that we know and our joy will not be satisfied in anything less. Let's pray. start off in here because I have no idea how many people are going to uh, so it's let's start off in a large room and if we can move to a smaller room we will if not we'll stay in here so at four o'clock if you don't have your books yet don't worry just come on and uh, we'll, we'll go over that at four o'clock but you're all welcome and then on Wednesday evening we began a new study 
uh, called Undivided. Now that the time changed, maybe that, that is a little different for you. It doesn't get as dark quite as early anymore at 630, uh, so Wednesday evenings, but uh, hopefully I'll see you tonight at 4 o'clock. God bless you. Thank you.